inflation is front and center in everyone's mind, whether you're a bond investor or an equity investor. Countries like China don't differentiate between civilian and military in the same way. The U.S. is the U.K.'s largest single country trading partner. I have never set a deadline for any trade negotiation. This is Bloomberg Surveillance Early Edition with Francine Lacroix. Well, good morning, everyone, and welcome to Bloomberg Surveillance Early Edition on this Wednesday, the 14th of July. I'm Francine Lacqua here in London. To all of our French viewers, also happy Bastille Day. Here's what's coming up on today's program. U.S. inflation surges by the most in 13 years. The Fed Chair Jay Powell faces a two-day grilling in front of Congress. J.P. Morgan Goldman's slide after suffering worse than expected slumps in fixed income trading. Today, Bank of America, City, Wells Fargo also report. And SPACs, Commodities and the Super League were joined later in the program by VAM Investment Chairman Francesco Trapani and AC Milan President Paolo Scaroni. So first thing is first, let's get straight to our top story. And of course, it's the markets and inflation. U.S. headline inflation prices accelerated to 5.4% year on year in June. That's the most since 2008. Now, here's what some of our guests and banking heavyweights had to say about that figure. We see some of the reopening, restart uh, inflationary pressures coming through. What today's CPI number tells us is that the market's going to switch to worrying about inflation again. Inflation is front and center in everyone's mind, whether you're a bond investor or an equity investor. The bond markets are sending a very clear message. This is not a big deal. It's transitory. And yet the increases are going faster for longer. I'm not going to assume that it's going to be transitory. A large part of that will have to get passed on to consumers. Investors should certainly prepare for the possibility that bond markets are wrong. Inflation could be worse than people think. I think it's going to be with us through the better part of next year. I don't think it's all going to be temporary. This is not going to be music to the Fed's ears. That doesn't matter if we have very strong growth. Well, today, Jay Powell begins two days of testimony in front of Congress, and the June CPI print may make his job convincing lawmakers that upwards pressure are transitory significantly harder. Well, let's get straight to our next guest. He's Koku Agbo Blua. He's Global Head of Economics, Cross Asset, and Quant Research at Societe Générale. Koku, thank you so much for joining us on a day like today where it's actually unclear what exactly we're looking at. We have a wonderful piece by our John Authors basically going through 35 targets to try and figure out out whether we're measuring it correctly, whether we're looking at the right thing. And his assumption is that actually we should be looking through this bout of inflation. Would you agree? Um, yes, absolutely. So we put out a piece uh, on in our global economic outlook called Inflationary, Inflation Transitory Until Proven a Permanent, um, because there's a whole host of arguments, and I've seen uh, the arguments that you've portrayed uh, so far. But our take is that um, you have a base effect. So last year we had, you know, the oil price future closing uh, in negative territory. So if you're comparing uh, the basket of goods and services versus today versus last year, it's not a surprise for the base effect to be uh, showing higher inflation, even if it's higher than expected. Uh, the, the point, though, is that you have the concept of demand satiety uh, and supply response to high prices that would normalize things uh, over time. And let's not forget that the Fed was fed up with inflation, pun intended, uh, at their last, last FOMC meeting when they signaled a faster than expected rise in interest rate as of 2023, which would suggest tapering as of this year. So the Fed is not, uh, has already reacted, which has tapered um, five-year, five-year break-even inflation expectation. And that's why the bond market is not, uh, you know, going, uh, uh, collapsing at this stage. Yeah, the, the, the bond market certainly doesn't seem to be as worried as they were three weeks ago. We also heard from, you know, the New Zealand Central Bank, and actually a lot of the focus there, including the Bank of Canada, that, that could turn more hawkish. Are we underestimating, you know, the, the hawkishness of certain central banks' moves that could actually push at least central banks in the region to act faster? Absolutely. So this is clearly uh, the, the pressure in respect to each economy. I mean, the, the UK is also seeing bouts of inflation or at least figures that are higher than expected. Uh, you mentioned other uh, countries that will have to face some of these pressures in emerging market, for example. Um, and I think that um, this is has to be based on data and facts. Um, but ultimately, when it comes to the US and, and Europe, uh, we're still not at peak jobs. So the output gap is pretty I think, significant, even though there are 
uh, supply labor uh, shortages uh, in some areas. Um, but ultimately, when it comes to these two uh, major economies, which influence the global nature of inflation, uh, we don't see the uh, reaction being of sooner than expected. Uh, Gaku, what are you uneasy about right now? So th there are concerns about China. There's concerns of where China growth is headed, also with the crackdown on certain technology companies. Is China your biggest mm. worry, or is it something else? Well, the biggest worry, and the, let's say the known unknown, is what I call the double elephants in the room. Uh, because if you go into 2020, 2022, what you realize is that um, there's tapering by the Fed, and there's question about you know whether we raise rates sooner uh, let's say, end of uh, 2022 or early 2023. But at the same time, we're going to be feeling a, a tapering of fiscal policy as well, uh, because budget deficits are going to shrink and, and reduce. And same thing when it comes to some of the European countries to start repairing the sovereign balance sheet. So facing double slowdown or double tapering, fiscal and monetary, could be a bigger drag uh, on the uh, economic activity than we suspect. So this is, I think, what the bond market is is pricing, and this is why they are not looking to uh, react too aggressively because of that backdrop of fiscal uh, yeah. stimulus slowing down. Uh, Koku, also today, the European Union is set to unveil this landmark deal on how to phase fossil fuels. How much does that translate into the real economy? Could there be, if not a shock, some kind of tr transitionary hiatus at some point? Well, this is a, a, a very important point, and this is the next generation in EU, EU or the European Green Deal around the uh, uh, energy transition. For us, this is potentially a green revolution. Uh, you know, you can think of it as the Marshall Plan or the industrial, industrial Revolution at the beginning of the century, uh, because it will give industries, autos, oil and gas, uh, opportunity to invest into sustainable growth. Um, so these restrictions, I think, are triggering uh, a force for good, so to speak, uh, and obviously some disruptions. But ultimately, we believe that these fiscal stimulus with the green tilt ultimately have the potential for generating a sustainable, uh, a sustainable growth. Koku, thank you so much. Uh, Koku Agbo Blua, their global head of economics, cross asset, and quant research at Societe Generale. Now, I mentioned it, it's Bastille Day, so happy Bastille Day uh, to all of the French watching us and listening to us also on radio. We're also looking at live pictures of Emmanuel Macron. Today is what we call in France the défilé of the 14th of July, which is a huge military parade. Remember, a couple of years ago, uh, President Trump actually was very impressed by it and then went back home and actually asked uh, for the same thing. We'll see also the Patrouille de France. Uh, uh, later on with the, the flying tricolor over Paris. We'll have plenty more on that. Smart conversations continue on Bloomberg Surveillance Early Edition. We have a lot coming on because later in the program we speak to the VAM, VAM Investments Chairman. He's Francesco Trapani about their SPAC launch in Amsterdam. It's all about consumer. And then after that we speak to the AC Milan Chair and former ENI Chief Executive Paolo Scaroni. Up next we discuss U.S. bank earnings. If you have any questions for any of our guests or for us, just IB Plus TV Go. This is Bloomberg. Economics, finance, politics. This is Bloomberg Surveillance Early Edition. I'm Francine Lacroix here in London. Now let's talk about the banks and investors are closely watching the latest U.S. big bank earnings for clues on how the pandemic recovery is playing out. J.P. Morgan, Goldman Sachs gave mixed signal, signals yesterday. Today it's Wells Fargo, Bank of America and then Citigroup's turn. Well, let's get straight to our Bloomberg finance reporter. She's Nabila Ahmed. And Nabila, I am so excited to actually uh, have you on the program. Let's start with the positives. Investment banking performance was great for both JP Morgan and Goldman Sachs. What were the numbers like? Francine, this was a quarter where the investment bankers definitely had to step up to offset some of the losses from those trading businesses. And they absolutely delivered. At Goldman Sachs, we saw a 36% jump in the investment banking revenue to $3.6 billion. Remember, Goldman actually advised on each of the top five deals of this year. That includes that mega merger between Discovery and Time Warner. That was $43 billion. 
JP Morgan also advised on that deal and they had a record quarter for their investment bank, rising 25% to $3.57 billion. And this all comes as global deal making is enjoying an absolute banner year. We've already had two and a half trillion dollars of volume in the first half, Francine. Nabila, investors ended up selling because I guess they're focusing on the things they're worried about. That's exactly right. Look, this was always going to be a tough quarter because of all of those stellar performances we saw from trading this time last year in the middle of the pandemic and the volatility that induced. So it was always going to be hard. But what investors are really focusing on is what is happening in the future. Will deal activity hold up, for example? And will that come at a cost? Will banks have to actually pay up to retain and attract top talent, top deal makers? And Jamie Dimon certainly didn't uh, assuage any fears there today, saying that, uh, you know, um, if, if, if they can hire good bankers, they're going to spend the money. And he said, you know, we don't manage the company so that we can tell analysts what the expense number is going to be. So costs are definitely an issue. There's also a question mark over loan growth and when consumers will be ready to spend again. So uh, what does it tell us about how the recovery is going? and the reopening. Well, Diamond said that he thinks that consumers are ready to go and that they're going to be ready to spend pretty soon. And that is a really good sign. And certainly from market-related activity, consumer spending levels, credit quality, there were some really good signs. But the question is, when do consumers step it up a bit? We saw loan growth for consumers actually down this quarter. And both Goldman and JP Morgan, interestingly, also warned about this new Delta variant of the virus, Francine, and what that might do to uh, the recovery and also to deal making going forward. Nabila, thank you so much. A Bloomberg Finance reporter there, Nabila Ahmed, joining us this morning. Now, coming up, we'll have plenty more, of course, on the banks. Smart conversations continue on Bloomberg Surveillance Early Edition. Later on in the program, we also speak to the AC Milan chair and former ME chief executive, Paolo Scaroni. Up next, though, we speak to the Bluebell Capital chairman, Francesco Trapani, about their SPAC launch in Amsterdam. Coming up, more on all of that. We look at markets, we look at bonds, we look cross assets. This is Bloomberg. Economics, finance, politics, this is Bloomberg Surveillance Early Edition. I'm Francine Lacqua here in London. Now, our next guest is Francesco Trapani. For many years, he was chief executive of the Italian luxury company Bulgari. Currently, he is a chair of activist investor Bluebell Capital and the executive chairman of VAM Investments Group. He joins us today to discuss the launch of VAM's SPAC in Amsterdam. Mr. Francesco Trapani, thank you so much for joining us. When you look at exactly what you're working on and focusing on, it's very clear that it's consumer. So where do you see the most value? Does the way that the pandemic actually affected me and you and everyone else mean that we will shop differently and is that where you see opportunities and value well as a matter of fact we are looking at the consumer segment on a i would say european level because our spec would be european so um basically you know at this at this stage i think we have a competitive advantage with the ipos because uh, while when you do an ipos you have to uh, you know clarify what you have done in the recent past uh, this is not the case when you do a SPAC because uh, there is a different relationship. You have one single shareholder that is able to dedicate that enough time to understand your past and your uh, future uh, uh, future expectations. So uh, it, it's a better uh, proposal for uh, uh, properly evaluating your company. Where do you see, uh, Mr. Trapani, the, the way that we consume? How does that change? Does it change more for luxury because we might online? Does it change more for the way we pay for things? Where would the biggest shift actually come from post-pandemic? Yeah, we have seen a strong acceleration in luxury. Uh, this is the case because there are two regions, Asia on one side and 
US on the other side are performing extremely well. Uh, this is influenced also by digital, to be honest, um, because of course the fact that we cannot uh, you know, go in, uh, in, in, uh, in stores, uh, touch people, and et cetera, is accelerating uh, the, the business done with uh, uh, digital. So these are the two areas uh, that are actually showing uh, very positive results in the past uh, weeks or a uh, or, or few months, actually. Is it, I mean, what do you worry about the most for your SPAC? Are there, you know, if you look at the consolidation phase and actually some of the bigger groups also interested in some of the smaller groups or M&A that seems to be picking up and back on track, is it going to be difficult for you to find your targets? Uh, no, we have, you know, we have two different things. On one side, we have an organization of uh, uh, private equity. So we have people on the field that actually are uh, looking around and, and see which are the different opportunities. Uh, on the other side, we have a short list of uh, companies that we know extremely well uh, and uh, that we are looking uh, closely. And when you talk about this short list of companies, you find a bit of everything. So you find, for example, uh, in a particular sector, uh, two champions of a specific uh, business uh, that are in two different areas. So combining the two, you would have a champion in Europe by far, actually. Uh, you have in another segment, uh, you have the world leader in, uh, um, in beauty, um, big company with 110 million EBDA uh, and production in three different continents uh, and so on. So you have the different opportunities uh, in, in different segments. So, Francesca, where do you see the biggest? Where do you see the biggest proposition? Is it also because of a region, because people consume differently in China than it is in Europe? Like, if you look at the criteria of some of the targets that you'd like to focus on, what's your number one and two criteria? Region, and space, or is it more of what they're actually, you know, selling? I would say, we've seen that um, it depends. We have uh, certainly. Uh, the region in the sense that there are um, companies that we look at that are very exposed to um, the, the Asia on one side and to the US on the other side. Um, and we have also, um, you know, uh, companies uh, that are maybe in the wrong area today that is Europe, but they do uh, a specific business that is actually doing extremely well even in Europe. So we are looking into the two different uh, uh, propositions. And what part of the segment exactly would you be focusing on? Luxury first or luxury second? Is there like a technology enabler that would be on your radar? We actually have several uh, targets uh, under our radar. Um, and, you know, some of them, as I said before, are very focused on a specific uh, industry. Others are more focused on geography. So we are going to be opportunistic. As you may know, this is a, a business where, where you have to be opportunistic because at the end of the day, what you have is a pot of capital uh, that has an expiration date uh, that is in two years' time. And if you're not able to do a combination, by the end of the two years, you lose your uh, promote, you lose your uh, uh, at-risk uh, capital. So while uh, we are working on uh, different yeah. targets uh, that are, uh, you know, uh, combined differently, um, we will be opportunistic and we will do the, the first one that comes. So why Amsterdam for the SPAC? First of all, why exactly did you choose for a SPAC and why Amsterdam? We have you know, we started thinking about uh, a SPAC a few months ago when actually the place to uh, list the SPAC was the U.S. Um, so uh, we started with this idea, but then uh, when we went into, you know, some discussions, we realized that uh, our territory is going to be Europe. And in Europe, you have plenty of companies that are uh, possibly able to be listed uh, in Amsterdam and won't be actually uh, a able or, uh, let's say, uh, willing to be listed uh, in the U.S. because it's a market that is far away, because very often they do very little business there, and so on and so forth. So we decided then to switch to Europe. And when you switch to Europe, 
the only real place today is possibly uh, Amsterdam because it's the place that actually um, you know uh, has a platea of uh, investors that are actually international. So you have plenty of uh, U.S. and U.K. investors that are uh, you know willing to invest in Amsterdam as well as. Uh, some number of uh, uh, local quote unquote investors that are Italian or French that actually are uh, you know ready to invest in Amsterdam. This is why we have decided then at the end to uh, list the company in in Amsterdam. At the end of to the day, Amsterdam. you know, we are actually talking about yeah about a company that will uh, work in Europe. So it's uh, you know. Uh, it, it, it's it, we can Francesco, actually list the company in Amsterdam. Thank you. Francesco Trapani, their executive chairman at VAM Investments Group. Now, in the meantime, we look, of course, at the markets. Some more smart conversation continuing on Bloomberg Surveillance Early Edition. Up next, we also speak to the AC Milan chair and, of course, to the markets. So futures mixed post CPI data. This is Bloomberg. U.S. inflation surges by the most in 13 years. Fed Chair Jay Powell faces a two-day grilling in front of Congress. J.P. Morgan and Goldman slide after suffering worse than expected slumps in fixed income trading. Today, Bank of America, City and Wells Fargo report. And inflation, commodities and the Super League were joined by the AC Milan chair and former NE chief executive Paolo Scaroni. Well, good morning, everyone. I'm Francine Lacqua here in London, and welcome to Bloomberg Surveillance, the early edition. Now, we have quite a lot going on on this Wednesday, July the 14th. First of all, happy Bastille Day to everyone watching us from France. Second of all, uh, the markets are definitely on the move, so we'll get on to those in a second. Futures mixed after the post-CPI data out of the U.S. Now, let's get straight to the Bloomberg. First third news, here's Leanne Gerens. Hi, Leanne. Hi, Francine. Sydney has extended its lockdown for a further two weeks as Australia's most populous city battles a COVID outbreak. The city recorded 97 new cases yesterday. The slow vaccine rollout has made the country particularly vulnerable to the Delta variant. Now, deadly protests that erupted in South Africa following former President Jacob Zuma's arrest show no signs of letting up. Even as the army was deployed, hundreds of stores have been looted in KwaZulu-Natal and Gauteng provinces. The violence has claimed more than 70 lives. Here in the capital, face masks will remain compulsory on the London Underground and buses. Despite the government lifting the legal requirement at a national level next week, Mayor Sadiq Khan criticised Boris Johnson's plans and said passengers will need to keep wearing face coverings unless they are medically exempt. Global News, 24 hours a day, on air and on Bloomberg Critic, powered by more than 2,700 journalists and analysts in more than 120 countries. I'm Leanne Gerens, this is Bloomberg. Francine. Leanne, thank you so much. Now, our next guest is Paolo Scaroni. He's a current chairman at AC Milan football team. Before then, he was chief executive of one of the oil super majors, ENI, for almost 10 years. Before ENI, he was a chief executive of Italy's biggest utility, Enel. So let's get straight to Paolo Scaroni for insight on oil, on OPEC, and of course, on football. Paolo Scaroni, thank you so much for joining us. When you thank look you. at what we saw in OPEC over the last 10 days, it was division, uh, possibly actually the alliance also breaking apart. What does it mean for the price of oil for the next six and 12 months? Well, if this uh, division doesn't compose and if OPEC plus doesn't increase production, prices of oil can only go up because consumption is going up as a consequence of the opening following the vaccination, the mass vaccination, particularly in developed economies. So consumption will continue to go up through the next semester. And if production doesn't follow, prices have to go up, also because inventories are relatively down. Uh, everyone expects that there might be a composition between the UAE and, uh, and Saudi Arabia, in fact. Uh, but for the time being, there is no sign that this composition will happen anytime soon. Paolo, what worries you the most about the, the world economy and the European economy? So is it inflationary pressures that could also be coming through commodities or is it just how we're handling the virus? 
Now, I have to tell you that I'm not particularly worried at all. I, I think that the European economy will improve uh, and it's continuing to improve month after month. The Italian economy as well. So for the time being, I believe, apart from hypothesis of having oil prices really skyrocketing, which I don't think will happen, I see only positive news in front of us. Inflation, yes, is picking up, but it's, uh, in my view, a, a temporary phenomenon. Uh, and therefore, I think we have good news ahead of us. Uh, what, is there anything that actually could make you less confident about the future? If inflation, I don't know what you do with inflation, but could there be some kind of market shock because of inflation taking a stronger hold than we're expecting, and so monetary policy doing something different? When you go around the world, or actually now probably on Zoom, speaking to chief executives, do they point to this as a concern? Well, everyone thinks that at least for the next couple of years, interest rates would continue to be extremely low as they are today. Yes, there are some inflation, particularly in raw materials, but even this inflation in raw materials is kind of leveling off right now. And uh, apart from, you know, in the economy, you can always have something new that you are not expecting. But if this does not happen, I see really blue skies in front of us for the next 18 months. Then what will happen? Uh, later, how the central banks all over the world will, will start restricting the immense liquidity that we have in, in the, all the economies of the world. That's another story, but for the time being, I'm not worried. Um, Paolo Scorini, when you look at you know the, the hopeful Italy when it comes to investors and things like that, are you confident that the plan put in place to use the EU money will go in, in the right places? So for digital transition and for a green transition? No, first of all, let me tell you that every morning I wake up and I think how fantastic it is to have Mario Draghi as Italian Prime Minister because it gave to Italy a, a level of credibility we didn't have for a long time. And this is true for, uh, okay, the recovery plan is true for the investors, and true for the Italians as well, who are more willing to invest and to believe in the Italian economy than before. So I have to tell you, I'm quite positive on Italy, also because we have Mario Draghi as prime minister. Uh, Paolo Scorani, let's also talk, of course, about football, which is, you know, with, with your other hat. We saw, first of all, congratulations to Italy, of course, on the win of the Euro uh, 2020. And then it was really plagued by really awful and horrible incidents of racism, especially against uh, the three football players here in England that missed the penalties. What does football need to do to eradicate racism? Uh -huh. Listen, I believe that what happened in England has been uh, action of few idiots that you have everywhere in the world. So it's, it's not to say that we have to tolerate that. We have not at all to tolerate these kind of, of, of things. But I don't think that English people are racist at all. I think they have demonstrated for years that they are open that they are um, certainly not racist. If few idiots do these kind of things, we have to be very, uh, you know, very much against it, but let's not generalize the phenomena. As AC Milan in particular, we have been developing a, a special project to, to defeat racism in Italy as well, uh, because even in Italy we had some similar phenomena, and uh, we really believe that everyone has to take action against it. I've seen what happened in England, uh, the, the football association, the politicians, uh, even the royals have been extremely clear on that. And uh, we have to continue in that direction. So what, what kind of policies would you put in place? Is it AC Milan putting, you know, actually banning people from going to matches or is it putting pressure on technology companies, on social media companies, so that these, you know, awful things don't get posted online? Well, we, on, on this, we have to use the technology to identify people that in the stadium 
are, have a racist behavior. Uh, lately, as you know, Italian stadia has been closed, so the, the phenomena didn't exist. But as soon as we will start uh, again to open the stadia, we have to use technology uh, to identify people, because this is the only way in which we can really act uh, on, on racism in stadia. Uh, Paolo Scaroni, on the Super League, do you accept now that it was a mistake? Do you have any regrets about it? Well, a mistake. Let's say uh, the problems that have originated the idea of the Super League are still with us. Uh, most of the European top clubs are losing money and this, we cannot continue to lose money and to continue to invest in players in, in, uh, and, and to be at the top in this uh, fantastic sport, which is football. Now, uh, the, the project of the Super League, as it has been formulated, is dead on this, no doubt about it, but we have still the problem to solve. And so we have to invent, I mean, to identify, possibly together with UEFA, a, 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 a solution to the problem that we are living. Otherwise, there will be another, another uh, idea which will be originated outside of UEFA, and this is certainly not positive. How would you do it? What kind of idea? What's the solution here for you, Paolo? Well, there are several potential solutions. Some of them we can uh, imitate what has been happening in the US uh, for the NBA, for example. Uh, but at the end of the day, we cannot continue to lose money. And, and today, uh, we are losing even more money for COVID because the fact of having the stadium closed has been, uh, for all of us, something extremely negative, even on the economic uh, front. Uh, I see that in most of European countries, and I hope this will happen in Italy as well, we are reopening the stadia to see Wembley uh, full of people has been extremely encouraging to me, uh, but that's not enough. We need to find other ways to restore the economics of the European clubs. Uh, Paolo Scaroni, thank you so much for joining us today. He's the chairman of AC Milan and, of course, deputy chair also at Rothschild. Now, in the meantime, this is what the markets are doing. Uh, this is a picture for futures, a little bit mixed uh, ahead of that uh, j Powell testimony and post-CPI data in the U.S. So I look at treasuries. We also look at the big U.S. inflation debate, really stirring the debate on how long the Federal Reserve will maintain ultra-loose policy. The 10-year U.S. Treasury yield retreating to about 1.4 percent, dollar also trimming some of the gains after yesterday's surge. We'll have plenty more on that. We'll also look at bank earnings. Coming up, the European Commission will table a package of energy and climate laws today, intending to get the continent to net zero. We get more on this and the impact it will have on Europe's auto sector next. This is Bloomberg. Finance politics. This is Bloomberg Surveillance Early Edition. I'm Francine Lacroix here in London. Now we look at the markets, we of course look at politics, and there's quite a lot going on today. The EU unveils how it plans to become the first carbon neutral continent by the middle of the century. Now the bloc promises to cut 55% of its emissions by 2030. An overhaul of the transport and industry sectors, as well as carbon border levy, are expected. So for more on this, let's get straight to our Brussels correspondent, Maria Tadeo who joins us from uh, the capital. Maria, what exactly is the EU saying when it calls Fit for 55? What does it actually entail? Yeah, Francina, you know, a lot of people do like uh, to joke that it sounds like a diet, but in fact, it's a huge 
plan to cut down emissions by 55% when it comes to 2030. And Francine, today we're looking at a monster package. It is huge. This proposal from the Commission could change more than 13 European legislations, again, trying to cut down emissions. But not just that. This is going to affect pretty much the entire green spectrum in Europe. You're looking at pricing. You're looking at energy efficiency. You're looking at emissions being cut too, but also the ripple effect that this has on the industries that it touches from aviation to transport. The one thing to keep in mind, uh, Francine, about today's announcements, of course, is that this is a proposal from the executive. It's the commission. But again, the politics will have to sign this off. And we are expecting a negotiation between the European Parliament, but in particular, the heads of states and the European governments. Normally, this can take up until two years. But of course, in this case, time really is of the essence. 2030, that's the goal. And it really is around the corner. So whether it happens faster faster than usual remains to be seen, but that is definitely the intention. Carbon tax, Maria, and pricing are also taking center stage. Is Putin going to become more expensive? Uh, yes, and Francine, that's the question that, of course, for the business community is key. And the European Union will tell you it will become more expensive. It won't be incentivized. And this is the reality of the future industries. Now, in terms of today, there will be two pillars precisely looking at pricing. One is changes that we're expecting will be made to the European emissions trading system. This is where companies buy and sell credits to be able to pollute. The criteria around that is expected to change and more sectors be included. And then, of course, as you mentioned, the carbon taxes has been in the making for weeks. Again, the idea is that you do not shift your pollution somewhere else. You get taxed if you do import from heavily polluting industries into Europe. That is also expected to be announced today in this huge, huge monster package from the European Commission. Maria, thank you so much. Maria Tadeo there in Brussels for us with this pretty exciting announcement from the EU. Now let's get more on the impact of Europe's auto sector with Craig Trudell. He's our autos and industrials team leader. Good morning, Craig. Thank you for joining us. So what moves are we actually expecting from the EU on autos over the next few years? So the, the two big headlines are for 2030 and 2035. With 2030, it's a bit of a, a moving target at, at the moment, uh, you know, with, with the expectation that the target uh, for emissions reduction from cars to be somewhere in the range of 55 uh, percent, uh, uh, potentially up as high as 65 percent. The, the other big element of this that is really going to be interesting to, to watch is, is for 2035, uh, the target becoming 100 percent. So effectively, combustion engines uh, are, are phased out uh, by that point. So we've heard California set that date, uh, but, you know, and, and we've heard some some select countries uh, start to, you know, talk about uh, phasing out the combustion engine and sort of setting a date for that. But this would be uh, really unprecedented in terms of the scale of, of impact that that would have. Today's proposals kick off years of political wrangling with member states over, of course, how to do this and how to implement this. Where will this end up? Yeah, so we've, we've already reported on the idea that France in particular is concerned about uh, the, the idea that plug-in hybrids would be phased out as early as 2035. Uh, a lot of uh, the car makers want to see sort of a, a longer leash for those going forward. Uh, you know, they, they are investing heavily in EVs, but even companies like Volkswagen, which, uh, you know, is investing more in EVs than anybody else. Uh, Herbert Diess uh, was on Bloomberg Television yesterday talking about just the, the level of, of difficulty that uh, will be involved with just scaling up the battery production to support uh, this many EVs this, this quickly. It, it's really a matter of taking, you know, more, a cent more than a century of combustion engine uh, production capacity and sort of, you know, doing away with that and, and completely switching to batteries. That's going to be a really sort of uh, Herculean uh, effort uh, for the industry over the next, uh, you know, decade plus. Craig, thank you so much. Craig Trudell there, our autos and industrials team leader. Now, coming up, we'll have plenty more, of course, on the transition to green. Also, electric ambitions, as we just discussed, we hear next from Europe's biggest car maker about its plans to expand in the U.S. and go head-to-head -head with Tesla. This is Bloomberg.
Economics, finance, politics, this is Bloomberg Surveillance, early edition on Francine Lacroix -like here in London. Now, a lot going on, of course, in the markets, a lot going on with the EU and the green transition. Volkswagen is also stepping up its electric ambitions. It will decide this quarter on building more electric models in the U.S., betting that the Biden administration's support for battery-powered vehicles will actually help the German car maker return to the position it held in the market half a century ago. With the VW chief executive Herbert D. spoke with Bloomberg's Guy Johnson and Alex Steele. The U.S. is becoming an electrified country. Uh, the Biden administration heavily bets on electrification. Uh, we have been investing into fast charging. We have been, we already are in the investment phase of a plant which is going to be converted to electric car production. In the background, you see the ID4, which has a, which was very nicely received yeah. uh, in the United States. And we will come with, uh, with many new products. The ID bus, famous product, iconic product, Loved product in the in the United States is coming back to the US. Many more products, so I think we have to use that opportunity, and we will do the utmost to make sure that we is, get back to this to the position we wanted to be as a volume yeah. uh, manufacturer. You've only confirmed though uh, local production of the ID4 SUV in the US, and I wonder are there going to be other models as you talk about a lot more models that are going to be made locally, and can you give me a time frame for that? Uh, we are currently reworking our U.S. strategy and our team, Scott Keogh's team, uh, is working on that. We had a chat this morning. There are many ideas which we now we have to prioritize, but be sure we will come with more markets uh, from local production in the United States, and we're going to know which models this are going to be, I would say, latest in the third quarter. Dr. Deese, who are you going to take market share away from in the United States? I think, you know, it's now... Everyone is starting with a white sheet of paper, and the electric uh, market will be reparted differently than the ICE market. So we start from scratch, and it will depend on the... We have new competitors, Tesla being probably the most serious and, and the most uh, uh, successful, and it will depend a lot on the electrification strategy of the other market participants. Uh, we feel strong. We are, we are early. We have a strong platform. We have a wide range of cars. We are coming with electric electric cars from the premium segment, Porsche, Audi, and then in a broad range of Volkswagens. Uh, so uh, mm -hmm. we should be in all segments. We should become relevant. Well, that was the Volkswagen chief executive, Herbert D, speaking to you, Guy Johnson and Alex Steele, and of course, his green ambitious. Now, coming up, we'll have a full roundup of what we're seeing in treasuries. Again, the inflation debate once again at the forefront as Jay Powell testifies in Congress, but actually bonds are not moving that much. Same for treasuries. I would urge everyone to go and see uh, and read an opinion piece by our John Authors. Fantastic. Looking at 35 of the indices that he's looking at to make sure that there's not going to be surprise inflation. Well, Bloomberg Surveillance Early Edition continues in the next hour. Matt Miller is actually out this week, so I'll be joined by Kaylee Lines and Danny Berger. This is Bloomberg. Inflation is front and center in everyone's mind, whether you're a bond investor or an equity investor. The bond markets are sending a very clear message. This is not a big deal. It's transitory. And not only is it transitory, but policymakers will not have to budge in response to the inflation. We're just blowing away a forecast that was already revised up by a percentage point at the last FOMC meeting. So when does the Fed recognize that? This is Bloomberg Surveillance Early Edition with Francine Lacroix, Matt Miller, and Keely Lines. It's 10 a.m. in London, 11 a.m. in Berlin, 5 a.m. in New York, and 5 p.m. in Hong Kong on this Wednesday, July 14th. Our top stories today, high price problem. Fed Chair Jerome Powell will try to convince Congress that inflationary pressures are not a long-term concern. Powell begins two days of testimony today. And bumper day for U.S. banks. We'll get second quarter earnings reports from Bank of America, Citigroup, and Wells Fargo. And finally, Apple's expecting a run on iPhone. It plans to build as many as 90 million this year. That's a 20% increase. 
I'm Danny Berger alongside Francine Lacroix in London. Kaylee Lines over in New York with Matt Miller off all this week. And it is a day after a hot CPI reading, but we are no closer to solving the debate. Is inflation transitory or not? Francine, I'm so sorry if you are sick of hearing that T word. I hate to break it to you. It's not going anywhere anytime soon. <laughs> Yeah, I'm not. Actually, I love it because I found a Bloomberg Good. opinion piece <laughs> written by our John Authors who explains it beautifully, the 35 indices that he's looking at to, to try and figure out exactly whether we have sticky inflation or not. So I'm all for trying to figure out the inflation debate. And of course, the markets are also trying to figure this out because of that hot number. The other stories, of course, Kathy Wood, uh, maybe with a bit of a warning mm. on Chinese stocks. Kaylee, how is this all playing out in the markets? Well, it's interesting. Investors maybe seem to be following Kathy Wood's lead there because Chinese equities were the big underperformer in Asia overnight. Granted, pretty much every major benchmark in Asia was lower, including the Nikkei in Japan, the Hang Seng in Hong Kong, but it was Chinese equities that underperformed down more than 1%. And interestingly, I wanted to point out Chinese bond yields as well because they continue to inch lower. The 10-year yield in China down uh, again today. We're sitting at 2.93%. That's around the lowest level in about a year. And in foreign exchange, I wanted to point to the Kiwi, the New Zealand dollar, stronger against the U.S. dollar, the big outperformer in the G10 space, up about 8 10 of 1%. And that is after the central bank uh, said it will end QE this month. That is a surprise move. And now traders are saying maybe a rate hike will come as early as August. Here in the U.S., of course, we did get that hot CPI print yesterday. PPI on deck today, as well as more earnings from big banks. And where that leaves us is lower fractionally in the futures market. We're down just a point on S&P 500 futures after the index fell from a record high yesterday. But it was really the action in the bond market that got my attention because initially off the back of CPI, we saw the curve flattening out. Then we got a 30-year auction that was weak. That led to curve steepening, long-end yields moving higher. Today, though, moving back down two basis points on the 10 year we're just shy uh, of 1.4 percent and the curve is flattening out once again looking at the 530 spread. Also the dollar had its best day uh, in about a month yesterday it reached the highest since early April but it is weaker once again today down about a tenth of 1 percent Danny. Overall, a weaker day in Europe as well, Kaylee, more so than what we're seeing, as you pointed out, in the American equity futures. You have your UK ind indices falling about half a percent, Cacarone down three tenths of a percent. You're really hard pressed to find anything that's a big outperformer in Western Europe. Inflation, 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 inflation is also the name of the game when it comes to Europe. And I want to delve in more what's happening in the UK because UK stocks are down, but we have a very strong cable rate. Cable rate, it usually trades inversely to what's happening in the stock market. So that's up a quarter of a percent versus the dollar. Now, not only did CPI surprise yesterday in the U.S. to the upside, it happened here in the U.K. as well, coming in at 2.5 percent. Estimate was for 2.2 percent. So you have a U.K. front end of the curve that is perking higher with hawkish surprises now being priced in when it comes to the BOE. So that is at 0.33 when it comes to your U.K. five-year yields. But inflation across the board becoming a concern in Europe you're looking at a bund curve that is also steepening today by five basis points. And that, in turn, is giving a nice little lift to banks today, a Euro stock 600 bank index that's up seven tenths of a percent. That is the outperformer in a day that is otherwise looking pretty soggy uh, here in Europe, Francine. Yeah, let's see if those increases are durable or not. Uh, Danny Berger there with a wonderful look at the markets. Now, let's also look at what's ahead today. 8.30 a.m. Eastern time, we get U.S. PPI for June after that hotter than expected CPI reading yesterday. Then at midday Eastern time, we'll also get the start of Jay Powell's two-day congressional testimony. This is the big one. Any comments on inflation, again, likely to be in focus. Before all of that, though, the U.S. bank earnings, we're expecting Bank of America first stop around 6.45 a.m. Eastern time. Citigroup Wells Fargo around 8 a.m. And don't forget, it's also BlackRock Day. So let's get the latest on those bank earnings from Shanali Bazak, Bloomberg Wall Street reporter. Shanali, thank you for joining us early. Yesterday was pretty exciting. Today we're expecting more Wall Street. And actually, they're beating on quite a lot of performance or quite a lot of metrics. But it seems that investors sold some of the stocks because they're fo focusing on the negatives. Yeah, they certainly are. The bar is very, very high, Francine. And when it comes to Goldman Sachs and J.P. Morgan, where they fell short was largely fixed income and worries about an outlook for lending. So those are concerns we'll definitely share today. 
Investor expectations for fixed income performance at Bank of America and Citigroup are actually higher than they were over at Goldman Sachs, so the bar is very high. And over at net interest income, remember, we know that JP Morgan had reduced their full year outlook, and we're going to want to see whether Wells Fargo and Bank of America make a similar move. It's also very dependent on market performance, so there is room for that net interest income to fall even further than what the banks are saying this week. Uh, the other big issue is compensation okay. and costs. So if the bar is high then for the banks, how does it look for asset managers, Shanali, considering yeah. we have BlackRock today? It's a great question because when I talk to my sources, what they say is that the biggest competition they're seeing on Wall Street in terms of hiring is over at the investing space. So BlackRock, of course, is the biggest in that space. Uh, Wall Street is expecting BlackRock's uh, AUM to rise by almost $500 million. They have been at a record over $9 trillion, so significant inflows. We'll going to want to watch for Larry Fink's commentary. He's sounded concerns about inflation before. They're ever more significant today. From the banks yesterday, we've heard that J.P. Morgan largely thinks it's a tail risk, but they're not factoring it into their base case scenario. Are investors for BlackRock saying the same? All right, Shanali Basik, Bloomberg Wall Street reporter covering the asset managers and banks all day for us today. Thank you so much. And of course, tune in later today on Bloomberg to catch an interview with Bank of America chairman and CEO Brian Moynihan. That's at 3.30 p.m. New York time. And that'll be followed by a conversation with the CFO of Wells Fargo at 4 p.m. Meanwhile, Bloomberg has learned that Apple has asked its suppliers to build as many as 90 million next-generation iPhones this year, a sharp increase from its 2020 shipments. For more on this scoop, we're joined by Debbie Wu, Bloomberg Asia te tech reporter in Taipei. So, Debbie, this is an increase of about 20 percent. What does this signal? So, uh, clearly, this is uh, up from uh, last year's projection of uh, 75 million or so at the uh, uh, very beginning of the uh, uh, launch. And then this shows that uh, Apple is uh, expecting that uh, uh, consumers will, uh, uh, there will be a pent up demand once consumers see their life return to uh, relatively normal uh, from a COVID 19 outbreak last year. And so this year, while the, uh, uh, we are not expecting a significant uh, updates to uh, the functionalities. Uh, we ask, uh, this, this will be the second mm -hmm. year that Apple offers uh, 5G uh, handsets. And then 5G is the new communications technologies that will help uh, consumers stay connected either at home or on the go. So uh, uh, hopefully that uh, right. this will uh, uh, help boost the demand later. Debbie, thank you so much. Uh, Bloomberg's Debbie Wu there reporting from Taipei. Now on to the EU with this big climate deal that we're actually expecting to have details on today. It should unveil how it plans to become the first carbon neutral continent by the middle of the century, positioning itself as a global leader on climate change. Now among the bloc's promises to cut 55% of its emissions by 2030, but actually from the 1990s, not from today. Our Bloomberg European correspondent Maria Tadeo joins us now from Brussels. Maria, this will touch everything from the cars we drive to how we heat our houses. Yes, Francine, it's huge and it is a monster, even by European standards. We're expecting about 12 pieces of legislation to be introduced today. It changes, as you said, the way that we drive. It changes transportation, aviation. It also changes, of course, emissions. The focus very much on cutting down emissions 55 percent by the time we get to 2030. And, of course, the big aspect for the market, Francine, as you know very well, is pricing. We're expecting the European Commission to put forward changes in the European European emissions trading system. This is the biggest one in the world. Of course, as you know, it's companies that buy and sell credits to produce the criteria could be changed, more industries included in that. And of course, you have the big surprise that we're going to get. It's a carbon border adjustment mechanism, that carbon tax that could kick in in order to prevent what the European call unfair competition from high polluting countries and carbon leakage. So again, it's a monster package. A lot of this, of course, still needs to be signed off by the politicians. So today we do get the the proposal, but still a lot of details will be pending based on the politics. Big changes. Bloomberg's Maria Tadeo, thank you so much.
And I do want to take a quick check now on some stocks moving in pre-market trading here in the U.S. And I want to go back to that Apple story we were just discussing with Debbie Wu because it did move Apple suppliers in the Asian session. And that is true, too, for Taiwan Semiconductor. And those ADRs are up about four-tenths of one percent in pre-market trading. Of course, this company gets about 25 percent of its revenue from Apple. Another stock moving to the upside is SGO CO. Of course, the latest Reddit trader favorite stock, Wild Swings. Granted, that's no surprise with these Reddit stocks, but it was up 720 percent in the three days prior to yesterday, then plunged 52 percent yesterday. Today, though, a bit of dip buying up 14 percent in early hours. And one more stock moving to the upside as well is Newell Brands. This after an upgrade over at Raymond James. The analyst putting a $33 price target on the stock. That stock is up 3% in early hours to $27.30 a share, Francine. And there you go. <clears throat> We're all going shopping. Coming up next, Mathieu Savary, BCA <laughs> Research Chief Strategist. We'll talk about the banks. We'll talk about some of the stocks that Kaylee was also going through. We'll look at treasuries and dollar. This is Bloomberg. see some of the reopening restart uh, inflationary pressures coming through. What today's CPI number tells us is that the market's going to switch to worrying about inflation again. Inflation is front and center in everyone's mind, whether you're a bond investor or an equity investor. The bond markets are sending a very clear message. This is not a big deal. It's transitory. And yet the increases are going faster for longer. I'm not going to assume it's going to be transitory. A large part of that will have to get passed on to consumers. Investors should certainly prepare for the possibility that bond markets are wrong. Inflation could be worse than people I think. It's going to be with us through the better part of next year. I don't think it's all going to be temporary. This is not going to be music to the Fed's ears. That doesn't matter if we have very strong growth. Reaction there to the hotter, to the higher than expected U.S. CPI reading yesterday. Now let's get to, straight to our top story, and that is exactly how we look at inflation. Of course, I'm sure Jay Powell will be bombarded when he's asked questions in Congress. The first day of two days starts today. To talk about inflation and how the markets could move is Mathieu Savary. He's chief strategist at BCA Research. Mathieu, thank you for joining us and for waking up early for us. When you look at inflation, it now gets to a point where I feel like every hedge fund, every market, every bank is looking at their own indices to try to figure out whether it's a transitory inflation or it isn't. What are your top ways of actually measuring inflation? Do you trust the central banks or do we have to make our own indices? Well, uh, first of all, thank you for having me this morning. Uh, when it comes to measuring inflation here, we do some adjustments that go beyond removing just the, the the food and energy. Uh, we do remove a bit the impact of the um, the effects of the reopening. So removing, obviously, the used cars and trucks, but also things like uh, restaurants, uh, um, tra air travel, and things like that. Right. And uh, on this measure, yes, there is some inflation, but it's not yet particularly concerning. Measures also like trim mean CPI, uh, median CPI also have perked up, which is inevitable. Right but they do not point either to the uh, extremely widespread inflationary pressure that the headline of core CPI are highlighting right now. So, Mathieu, the reason we're trying to figure out whether or not it's sticky is because it's going to mean something for the Federal Reserve, and Jay Powell is going to have to answer uh, to this print when he testifies on Capitol Hill later today. How high of a risk do you think there is of a policy mistake coming from the Fed? The risk of a policy mistake is elevated right now, but uh, the Fed has been very clear that it will look through inflation. Whether that's right or wrong uh, is another matter. For what matters the most for the Fed at this point in time remains the state of the labor market, remains how quickly are we going to achieve an unemployment rate that's consistent with its definition of maximal uh, employment, which seems to be an unemployment rate below 4% or so. Uh, so okay. for the time being, it's unlikely that the Fed will change its message despite the strong uh, inflation uh, numbers uh, from what was said uh, uh, at the last meeting. So if that will likely be Powell's reaction, how do you account for the market reaction? We saw small caps crushed yesterday, falling more than 1.8%. I mean, if you told someone a couple weeks ago that higher inflation equals small caps going down, I mean, they probably wouldn't have believed you. 
Yeah, so there is a few things there. There's obviously this idea that the Fed will continue to focus on the uh, employment situation, but markets are also right to price in a little bit of tail risk around that. So that's point number one. Point number two is also what's going on uh, outside of the United States, outside of the uh, inflation pressure. We've seen uh, some resurgence uh, in the case of uh, COVID related to the, co to, the um, to, to the Delta variant. So that's uh, unnerving the market. Yeah. And additionally, the Chinese economy is showing sign of slowing down a little bit because of the strong deceleration that we've had in the credit impulse. Now, the PBOC has cut the reserve requirement ratio. So, Mathieu, ratio. what does it mean... Yeah. So what does it mean for where you want to place your money? What's the best bet on the markets right now? So in the near term, it is to remain a bit conservative because you have all those forces that are pointing in various directions and uh, it's very tricky. So we are... Um, neutral on cyclicals relative to defensive in the market uh, in the near term. But we are using this really as a moment to pause uh, and look for the best opportunities that will be available down the road uh, in the cyclicals. Because at the end of the day, uh, we do believe that the Fed will be slow to increase interest rate very sharply. Uh, any slowdown in the Chinese economy is temporary and right. uh, the COVID risks are also temporary. So for the time being, uh, we are a bit concerned conservative, but we are using this really just to buy uh, cyclical assets uh, later down the Matthew, road. We like financials. When it comes to cyclical assets, you like the financials here, even with the earnings we've seen this week? Uh, yeah, we do like the financials, but we are actually uh, preferring uh, European financials uh, when it comes to the next uh, leg of the rally. And the reason is that unlike in the United States, uh, the European financials are still priced as quite risky uh, firms, while the reality is that uh, we are seeing that NPLs are very, very well behaved, the tier one capital ratios have been well rebuilt in Europe, and uh, the economy is reopening is benefiting from this phenomenon and this will ultimately put some upward pressure uh, on the German yield and result in a steepening of the German yield curve relative to the US yield curve. So we think that in this context, mm. considering the pricing of European financials, European financials will be the place where most of the profits will be to be made for investors. And they're certainly hoping for that to play catch up with where the U.S. financials are. Mathieu, thank you so much for joining us. That's Mathieu Severe, chief strategist at BCA Research. Now, later today, Fed Chair Jerome Powell will appear before the House Financial Services Committee. We'll bring you full coverage of that. The testimony is going to be starting at 12 p.m. New York time. Here in London, it starts at 5 p.m. This is Bloomberg. This is Bloomberg Surveillance Early Edition. I'm Kaylee Lines in New York with Francine Lacqua and Danny Berger in London. Matt Miller is off today. Now let's get the first word news. And Senate Democrats on the Budget Committee have agreed on a $3.5 trillion spending plan that would expand Medicare and provide more generous child care benefits. The legislation would carry most of President Biden's economic agenda into law without Republican support. The agreement is a win for Budget Chairman Bernie Sanders. He had pushed for the Medicare expansion. Meanwhile, a sometimes critic of President Biden's economic policy, former Treasury Secretary Lawrence Summers, has met with the president's top economic advisors. Summers was at the White House yesterday. He and aides discussed the infrastructure legislation as well as the president's broader economic agenda. Summers has been sounding the alarm about inflation for months now. In China, state media outlets are blasting a U.S. plan for a digital trade agreement among Indo-Pacific economies. They call it a bid to protect American hegemony and the profits of tech companies. China Daily called the U.S.-dominated agreements, quote, shackles restricting trade. The Biden administration is discussing proposals for a trade deal as it tries to restrict China's influence. And Apple and Goldman Sachs are teaming up for a buy now, pay later plan. It would let consumers pay for any Apple Pay purchase in installments over time. Goldman would be the lender. The firm has been Apple's credit card partner on the Apple Card since 2019. So apparently, Danny, you don't need an Apple credit card to use this. I, though, use Apple Pay for pretty much everything at this point, a pandemic habit of mine. So this is an interesting one. 
I do too, and let me tell you where I stand, Kaylee. Either you need to give me less things to hold, i.e. let me do everything <laughs> with my iPhone, or you give me more pockets. You can't have it both ways, right, Francine? I, women's clothing doesn't have enough pockets, so I'm fine with right. only having Preach. an iPhone. That's cool with me. <laughs> Yeah, on this, you know, buy now, pay later, I've heard from a lot of banks this is probably the next frontier, and we saw Klarna actually with that crazy valuation out of Germany. Coming up, Marty Mosby, Vining Par Sparks, Director of Bank Advisory. He'll be on with us shortly. This is Bloomberg. This is Bloomberg Surveillance Early Edition. I'm Francine Lack with Danny Berger in London, Kaylee Lines in New York. Matt Miller off this week. Now, the focus, of course, is on the markets and on inflation. Just for a change, we focus on inflation after that CPI number <laughs> yesterday was red hot, Danny. And of course, again, once again, the question is how will Jay Powell convince Congress when he testifies? That first day starts today, but he has two days of it to make sure that actually they understand that inflation for the moment is transitory. And then when you look at the bond moves, they don't 100% believe it. Right, exactly. And and when it comes to testifying in Congress, of course, one thing that's going to be top of mind are these different infrastructure bills, these different fiscal policies they're trying to put across. And that means a lot more spending from the government. So surely Washington doesn't want to hear that interest rates are going to be moving higher. There's definitely a political aspect to the moment we find ourselves in when it comes to inflation and the policy response, Fran. Yeah, and Kelly, this is all playing out in the markets. It is. I think the market is honestly a little bit confused, Francine, especially the bond market, which took essentially a round trip yesterday. Now, of course, the equity market, too, is waiting for that PPI print at 8.30 a.m. Eastern time, as well as more earnings from big banks. In Europe, the stock 600 is lower by about a quarter of a percent. It's travel and leisure really leading the losses. Here in the U.S., though, futures have clawed their way into positive territory for now. S&P 500 futures up about two points. As I said, the bond market initially was a flatter curve yesterday off CPI, then a steeper curve off a weak 30-year auction. Right now, the 10-year yield is down about two points at 1.39% ahead of this morning's data, and the dollar is weaker on the day. As for some stocks moving in free market trading, I'm going to come back to SGOCO, the Chinese consumer electronics company. It has just had a wild ride. It lost more than half of its value yesterday after rallying 720% in the three days leading up to it. Today, it is higher by just about 4.4%. AMC is another Reddit stock that has been under immense pressure recently. It is down about 37% from its peak in June, lower by another 1.5% this morning. Apple, though, moving to the upside, that on a Bloomberg scoop, that it's looking to hike iPhone output this year by 20%. Also, Citigroup raising its earnings estimates for the company. And I just wanted to check on the financials ahead of the Bank of America City and Wells Fargo reports we're getting later today. The financial select sector spider ETF down about three tenths of a percent in pre-market trading, Danny. Kaylee, thank you for teeing my chart up just so oh, perfectly. Oh, you're welcome. Just so perfect. It's like <laughs> well, I did it I on purpose. Sticking. I know, I know, I love that. Well, I am sticking with financials, as you may have guessed, and I wanna welcome our radio listeners as well, and I will definitely explain to you the chart that I have up, but I think one of the most fascinating numbers of yesterday wasn't a 0.9% growth in CPI month over month. It's a 23% growth figure. So again, for our listeners, the chart I have up is the deposit growth at JP Morgan year over year. And so in the third quarter of last year, during the pandemic, when you have stimulus in the pockets of consumers, they're sitting on these high deposits, but it has remained high. And again, for our listeners, the last bar I have on here is a 23% growth for deposits at JP Morgan. Not only does that bode poorly for financials about getting that money to work, getting it to be loans and not deposits, but it also means when we're trying to decide what transitory means, how long this reopening trade lasts, there certainly is a lot of money that people are sitting on Francine that they could continue to spend throughout the rest of the year. Again, adding just another inflationary pressure. Yeah, and it'll be interesting to hear the other banks, actually, that are reporting today after we heard from a couple yesterday, JP Morgan, talking about how they see the recovery and possibly also talking about inflation. Now, outspoken analyst Mike May of Wells Fargo remains bullish on banks. Eventually, we expect higher interest rates, higher loan growth, higher traditional banking revenues, higher revenues from Main Street. And when that comes, that's uh, the next part of the story. So do not leave the U.S. bank stock show uh, yet. Yeah, it, uh, it's just, just intermission. 
Well, joining us now is uh, Marty Mosby. He's Director of Bank Advisory and Strategic Services as Vining Sparks. Marty, thank you for joining us. When you look at what we heard yesterday, which could maybe be replicated by some of the banks today, they're pulling in more money uh, from, you know, on the investment bank side as people do more deals and need more advisory clients. But actually, some of the trading was a bit disappointing. Does it seem that they're priced to perfection and that analysts will just focus on the negatives? Um, we are looking at a price point here that is much higher than where we were last year. And you really have to look at these bank stocks as uh, very cyclical entities. Uh, last year was all about credit. So you were building the provisions uh, in massive numbers uh, with the new accounting was forcing that up front, even though there wasn't any deterioration. And then over the last three quarters, we've been releasing almost all of that provision. Right. So all these earnings beats that we're seeing is really off the provision number, uh, and it's just you know pulling that back down as we have seen Marty, no deterioration in that in that credit side. But Marty, that is true. But also the investment bankers, the deal makers, are kind of knocking mm -hmm. it out of the park here. M and A IPO yeah. activity, those fees, uh, obviously pulling in a lot of revenue for these banks. How long do you think that can actually last? Yeah. So the disruption we had last year, and then pushing rates to a whole new level. A lot of this is debt issuance. Uh, a lot of that will be satisfied here in the next couple of quarters. So we are seeing the fee incomes that are supporting revenues. But if you look at J.P. Morgan's revenues yesterday, uh, a year ago it was $33 billion in the second quarter of 2020, uh, $32 billion in the first quarter, and then $31 billion. So the trend is actually in reverse, and that's because of what's happening on the interest rate side. Low interest rates for a prolonged period of time is putting pressure on net interest margins. And the graph you just okay. showed with all the deposits is creating competition for that lending, which is pushing pricing down for loans, which is also bad for mm. margins. So, Marty, then if it's an issue with loans, if it's an issue for net interest income, and as Kaylee pointed out, M&A is on fire with advisory type fees, is the trade now to look more to a Goldman Sachs versus a Bank of America that has less exposure to Main Street? Not, not really, because... When you start looking at Goldman Sachs, uh, their number yesterday was all built on the fact that the asset prices, the stock market, everything that you can invest in went up. So the inflation that you're looking for and we're seeing in CPI is fourfold worse when you look at the asset prices, commercial real estate, housing prices, car prices, any of those assets are being driven up 20% right now. So their value in the sense of what they've invested in went up substantially, and that's what they recognized yesterday, which is why they had their beat. That's unsustainable as well. So really what we have here is a sugar high that's driving a lot of these fee incomes that's not sustainable. The bread and butter of banking is net interest income, and it's under pressure, and it's been under pressure for the last year. But, but at the same time, credit levels, Marty, are okay, and that will continue. That will be supported by a recovery. And if you look at some of the consumer side, that also seems to be supported, right? So does it depend on which kind of bank will do better? Oh, there's a couple of things, yes. Yeah. So you, the, you got that right. The credit cycle is done. Uh, we're not going to lose any money on the credit. Uh, but the interest rate cycle is what people are undercutting, and this is not really appreciating how much pressure that's going to create. The banks that you want to look at are the ones that have hoarded all this deposit growth in liquid assets, and that over the next year, they can find either some incremental loan growth or opportunity, or they can find some way to put it back to work at a higher yielding security. So they're those that have that power keg, that can kind of push that out and begin to earn some money, or they have excess capital that they can repurchase or make M&A. So your M&A part will continue because their capital needs to be deployed. Uh, and so those that can deploy capital or deploy their liquidity are the things that are really going to make the difference here. Marty, just a quick final question from me on the competition for talent, which seems to be heating up. Does that make you worried at all about the expenses these banks are going to have to face in order to compete? Not, not really. Um, when you look at what they've been able to do, moving much more to a digital platform, uh, they will be able to kind of balance that out. Uh, digital costs are coming down. As we're talking to many of these banks, their core systems as they're going in and renewing them, uh, they're getting some cost benefits. Uh, they'll have to go out. And, and really what you're looking at in banking is we are so d d digital now, we haven't trained many uh, new bankers. Uh, and so just finding talent uh, to be able to go out and do the things like originating commercial loans 
uh, is really the the challenge, but yeah. it's, it's not something they can't overcome. Mm. Marty, great catching up with you. The quote of the quarter when it comes to banking, a sugar high that won't last. Thanks so much for joining us. That's Marty Mosby of Vining Sparks. And later today on Bloomberg, catch an interview with Bank of America chairman and CEO Brian Moynihan. That's at 3.30 p.m. New York time. It will be followed by a conversation with the CFO of Wells Fargo at 4 p.m. Up next, we have Randy Krosner, former Federal Reserve governor, on a day where Powell is testifying and a day after a hot CPI reading. This is Bloomberg. This is Bloomberg Surveillance Early Edition. You're looking live at the principal room. Coming up later today, an exclusive interview with Microsoft CEO Satya Nadella. This is Bloomberg. This is Bloomberg Surveillance Early Edition. I'm Francine Lacroix with Danny Berger in London and Kayla Lines is in New York. Matt Miller off this week. Now let's get straight to the top story of the day. Bloomberg Pillion columnist John Authors is also out with a must-read essay on inflation data after the CPI yesterday. Now he writes German inflation after a bubble this year is actually expected to fall back to 1.7% in 2023. There's no sign of a new reflationary cycle there or in Japan or even at China. He argues whatever markets say, the experts are still more worried about deflation. Well, joining us now is Randy Krosner. He's former Fed governor and deputy dean for executive programs at the Booth School of Business. Randy, as always, thank you so much for joining us. How difficult will it be for Jay Powell today and tomorrow testifying to Congress to convince them that actually inflation is transitory? Uh, that's um, a challenge, given the very strong inflation report we've just had um, yesterday plus the last two or three months of very strong inflation reports. But fortunately, so far, he seems to have convinced the markets because even though we've had these very high inflation numbers and above expectations, both market expectations and Fed expectations, um, the 10-year the rate has been coming down. Inflation expectations have been coming down a little bit or have basically been, uh, been flat. And so uh, he has convinced them. Uh, not easy, but he's pretty deft at, um, uh, at his words. So I think he's, uh, he's doing a good job. Randy, I mean, there was something quite controversial in the John Authors piece in saying that actually what they worry is about deflation. I mean, are deflationary pressures now out the window? Is it difficult to argue that when you see, you know, a 4% inflation print, but also 1.7, 1.8% in some European countries in 2023? So I think this is the challenge going forward. So it's, it's very clear that um, over the last few months and probably for the next few months, we're going to have some very, very high inflation numbers. What Jay and others at the Fed have argued is this is just transitory. We're sort of a things really kind of <laughs> fell out of the, the bottom fell out about a year ago, and we're just kind of making up for that. So it's really more of a one-time adjustment rather than an ongoing increase in, uh, in prices. And then the question is, what's going to happen next year? Will the uh, uh, will the Delta variant or some other variant? Uh, make us return to lockdowns and slow things down. And so then deflation is more of a threat right. or will the vaccines uh, cure all and we're just going to be roaring ahead and people spending up all that uh, that savings from the last year plus all the fiscal stimulus. We so don't Randy, know. I'm, I'm so glad you mentioned fiscal stimulus because of course we got the news overnight that the Senate Budget Committee has agreed on a three and a half trillion dollar uh, uh, spending level. Powell is definitely going to face some questions on that at, on Capitol Hill today. I'm sure he's going to try and duck and weave his way around them. But from your vantage point, is that overshooting it on fiscal spending? And could that lead to more inflationary pressures? He's going to be doing some tap dancing around uh, yeah. around that. Um, the I think it's very difficult to spend so much money so quickly uh, in a uh, in a way that's going to be productive for the economy. Because remember, a year ago was $3 trillion. Last December, everyone's forgotten about the trillion dollars last December. That's still a lot of money. Um, and then almost $2 trillion in the rescue package, and then now another 3 to $4 trillion. You know, when you put all those pieces together, that's almost 50% of GDP in a year, year and a half period. Even during wars, we didn't spend um, uh, that, kind of, uh, that kind of money. Now, this new package, not all of that's going to be spent immediately, but still, when you combine the fiscal stimulus with the pent-up demand and the high savings from the last year, if the economy can move ahead, so if the vaccines are effective against these, um, uh, the, the current variants and future variants, 
the economy is going to take off like a rocket, and that puts uh, the Fed in a difficult position. So is the Biden administration looking at giving this economy fuel that it does not need? So I would argue that I think it's going further than it needs. Now, some of it is longer-term spending, some of it is investment spending, which is totally sensible. But I don't think uh, the vast majority of it is uh, needed at this point. And I think sort of stepping back, making a very careful assessment of costs and benefits of what projects would be most effective would make sense. Um, and so I think uh, it's, it has the, the risk of putting a little bit too much fuel in the rocket. Well, given this level that Democrats are at least hoping for, whether or not it's necessary, does that mean that debt ceiling debates, as they approach closer, that deadline approaches closer, is it a risk event now, given the rate at which they're likely to blow through money? Well, well certainly the spending is, uh, is really quite, uh, quite high. And it's not unique. The, the U.S. isn't unique in having very high spending, although these additional amounts are, I, I think, um, very different than what other countries are doing, particularly here in, uh, in Europe. Um, and so uh, I think there are very important, um, uh, there are very important risks associated with that. And uh, um, we'll see if there is a debate on this uh, with the, the Democrats controlling both houses of Congress, uh, they may be able to, uh, to make it through that debate more easily. But there may be some Democrats um, who are very concerned about these high levels Spending, and I think not unjustifiably. Randy, what does a three and a half trillion dollar in tax and spending plan actually mean for the rest of the world? Do they need to step up with their, the, you know, their own stimulus, or otherwise really risk left left behind? Well, I think the key thing from each country's perspective is: can you know, are there projects that are, make sense to spend money on? So, are there bottlenecks in the economy where, if you make an infrastructure investment, it makes sense? Uh, some of the infrastructure investment is in our future generations, in education. That, I think, is something that's very valuable, and I think many countries should be thinking very carefully about that. Are they spending the appropriate amounts? Are they spending it in the appropriate ways? So I think just using this as an opportunity to think, ah, we've got to be on the right path for increasing productivity going forward. How can we invest, uh, invest more both in our future generations and in physical plant? And that sometimes is done so through... Um, tax incentives rather than through more hmm. government spending. So, Randy, does that mean that the mantle needs to be passed from monetary stimulus to fiscal stimulus? So I think you, you need to be careful about both. And I do think that um, uh, we, if the economy continues to, to, to grow, as we've been discussing, and we don't have challenges on the, on the health side, certainly we can be taking off the, uh, the, the foot off the pedal on, uh, on monetary policy. But I'm still not convinced that we need more fiscal policy. Hmm. Um, I think good infrastructure investments are useful at any time. Um, but uh, just spending for spending's sake um, or just trying to stimulate the economy even further, I'm not sure we need to do that now with, with right. such strong growth rates. I am going to be making a tally of how many times Jerome Powell today says that he, it is not his job to comment on fiscal policy and also how many times <laughs> he says transitory. Thank you so much for your time today, Randy Krosner, Deputy Dean for Executive Pro Man programs at the Booth School of Business. And later today, of course, Fed Chair Jay Powell will appear before the House Financial Services Committee, and we will bring you full coverage of that testimony starting at 12 p.m. New York time, 5 p.m. in London. This is Bloomberg. This is Bloomberg Surveillance Early Edition on Francine Lack with Danny Berger in London, Kaylee Lines in New York. Matt Miller is off this week. Our very own Tom Keen now joins us so with some great, great <coughs> charts. He's co-anchor of Bloomberg Surveillance. And Tom, I'm excited because you've done a chart for me, uh, bringing it back to 1990s. Well, it goes back to 1990, which means it goes back to the Asian crisis. There's like been three or four Asian crises, but that is 1998. And the idea here is the dynamics of the moment, and particularly with the inflation scare yesterday, what it's done to the litmus paper of the world system, Francine, and that is the U.S. dollar. This is Asia DXY. This is Asia's Pacific Rim, ex-Japan, as compared to the dollar. With the plunge in 1998, we come back with a strong, sobered Asia. Then we roll over into weaker Pacific Rim currencies. And a nice rebound recently where we're really on the cusp of testing that. So much of that is the relative interest rates and the guesses of relative interest rates between here and the Pacific Rim nations. 
And Tom, I'm also glad you're putting a bit of a spotlight apart from, you know, Jay Powell and, of course, the testimony on travel and leisure with the Marriott chief executive. Well, we're going to have the Marriott chief executive on. I mean, it is a pandemic and we're coming out. I am going to lead with the, you know, it's a, it's a, it's a hotel. Maybe it's a motel on the shores of the Venice question. <laughs> where, where maybe uh, they would have an interview with Christine Lagarde and we'll see if he uh, feels that your presence at the Daniele moved the, the Marriott brand. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but that, that would probably move into the second quarter. We d I have to say, given the price of a cappuccino, it probably did move. <laughs> it probably did move, yes. That's called a Marriott cappuccino uh, <laughs> in uh, Venice. This is a really interesting Wednesday. The news flow is extraordinary, uh, Francine. Right now, where we are is significantly different than where we were at 8 p.m. last night for Global Wall Street. Tom, thank you so much. Our Tom Keen there, co-anchor of Bloomberg Surveillance, with that important conversation, of course, on inflation, Treasury, but also the Marriott chief executive. Now, look at what else we're watching today and Kaylee Data and Jay Powell. It's all about inflation, Francine, both what the actual data shows us and then how Jay Powell reacts to it when he takes the hot seat on Capitol Hill later today. Of course, we get the PPI print at 8.30 a.m. Eastern time. The question is, will it come in as hot as CPI did yesterday? Economists are expecting the headline number at 6.7 percent on a year on your basis, 5.1% when you back out food and energy, but could there be room for an upside surprise? And is Jay Powell, even in light of that, still going to stick with his messaging that don't worry, Danny, it's just transitory? Just transitory. Yes, the T word never going away. Well, Kaylee, <laughs> while you're wa watching Washington, I'm watching Ottawa. And that's because the Bank of Canada has a rate decision today. And they were really one of the first central banks to come out and start talking about tapering. Well, today at 10 a.m., they are set to have that tapering. They're likely to cut bond purchases by a third. What we want to see here is them proving and giving the roadmap to the rest of the central banks that you can taper without a tantrum. So that's what I'm going to be interested in, Francine. I, I, again, I think Canada may be more interesting than North, the rest of North America today. Yeah, Canada is smaller, though, so easier also to manage temper tantrums, uh, a lot of investors <laughs> yeah. would argue. Now, this is what I'm watching now. It's an exciting one. It's a big take, but it's also the front cover of Bloomberg Business Week. It's the Moderna uh, chief executive actually talking about how they will use the mRNA technology against other illnesses, including flu, uh, HIV, but also cancer. It's a fantastic, fantastic interview. And it also reminds us that Moderna, just a year ago, was not even profitable. So it's amazing right. how, you know, in 12 months, it's now distributing 1 billion vaccine doses, and it could use this technology for many more illnesses across the world. We'll have plenty more on that throughout the day. Bloomberg surveillance up ahead. This is Bloomberg.